beautiful lucky here gift. It's another exciting episode of KW Judas. It'd be a coon's age before we ever got some honky tonk in this. <laughs> God dang. Well, you never know. We well, got old Michael Payne here as our <laughs> in studio guest. And I, well, I'm going to turn things over to your host. Now, uh, hang on a sec. Here's Judas. Uh, what's up? <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Hey, what's up? Hey. Hey. Thank you, Arliss, for getting the show started for me. Sorry I'm late. <clears throat> I was just uh, down in LeVan. <laughs> oh. Have you ever been down to LeVan? I've never been down to LeVan. It's... Is it down by the river? I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I usually try and beat people to that one, but no, it's down by a pond. And I was trying to go fishing, and old Carlos, not Arliss, but Carlos. Oh, okay, uh, Carlos. That's, that's the name of my car. Oh, okay. Car- uh, people name their cars? <laughs> you you <laughs> name your car Carlos? Carlos. But it's a car. Yeah. Well, it's like Arliss, but 
a car. Uh, okay. Me and old Carlos, we were down there at Levan, and old Carlos started giving me all sorts of different, you know, uh, indicators. The lights go blinky blink. You know uh-huh. what I'm saying? There was a teapot, and there was a lightning bolt, and there's something that looked like a battery. Also, something that kind of looked like a faucet. And they all just went shabang all at once. And so I was like, hmm, I think I probably better just head back home. Or else I'm on Miss Tonight's show. <laughs> Sounded like you better call a tow truck. I don't have AA just yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, AA or triple A? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll have to say both. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's enough out of you, Arliss. <laughs> You crazy bastard. So, John. (laughs) (laughs) We're already off to a very interesting start, aren't we? (laughs) I told you this show gets weird. It just doesn't usually get weird this soon. (laughs) I don't even know who I am right now. (laughs) I have Michael Payne. (laughs) So... Where do you come from, and where are you going? Uh, well, well, where I'm going, I don't know. We'll see about that. But uh, I'm actually originally from Palm Desert, California. California. Yeah. How long have you been in Utah? Been in Utah since 1992, and I uh, actually moved up here to go to college. To the U? To the U. Not the BYU? Not the BYU. So is the rivalry as thick as I understand it is? It seems to be, yeah. Is it really? Yeah, I never got too much into it. Uh, I think it'd be fun to go out and impaling uh, zoobies, you know, <laughs> putting their fucking heads on pikes and shit. <laughs> Isn't that what you guys do? You're the Utes. I mean, I mean, I, I, maybe some people did. I, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I never got into it. <laughs> uh, I'm all getting all excited. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's go and kill us some zoobies yeah, after the you know, show. You know, I think there's a group out there for everybody. <laughs> if not, then we're going to start one. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you, you can be vice president. There you go. <laughs> Kill all the zoobies on a pike <laughs> committee. Sorry, all you zoobies out there. But uh, I guess we're going full on Ute tonight. Yeah, that's right. I have had some. <laughs> I've had straight BYU professors on this show. So wow. I hope nobody is taking offense. <laughs> Take a gate or a chair instead. There you go. Haha. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put a, a rim shot in. Yeah, but uh, since I edit these shows now. Yeah, well, there I you can go. do that. Now. Yeah, yeah. There's there going to be a rim shot. <laughs> All right. In fact, I'll probably edit this part of the conversation. Uh, or I'll leave it in just because it's, it's like, I don't know breaking the fourth wall. Right. No, not really. Hey, well, all you people out there, don't you hate it when people break the fourth wall? Huh. All right. There we go. There we go. So, besides uh, your college. What made you stay here? Well, um, so my dad moved up here the year before I did. So you got family here? Yep, got family here. And so it uh, it worked out. I could come up here and uh, because uh, when I started at, at the U, I wasn't 18 yet. And because I wasn't 18 yet, I could actually get in-state tuition because my dad lived here for a year before I did. Right. And so it worked out really well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and I, I ended up staying here. Uh, actually I went on an LDS mission to Spain, um, and then Ooh. came back, um, and just kind of worked and did music and all that kind of stuff. So, um, just ended up staying here cause that's where the opportunities for me were. So what'd you go to school for? Two things. Uh, my first degree was in broadcast journalism. Word. And I was working in television. I worked for, uh, three different television stations here in the, in the, uh, area we and have three stations in this area we actually have uh well uh, of like the main networks we have four because we have uh channel four which is an abc affiliate channel right. two which is cbs okay um ksl which is nbc and right. then uh fox 13 which is fox so what about like kbyu and uh those are also yeah K-U-E-D? kbyu K- kbyu kued yeah uh, seven and right. eleven yeah, so, KUED yeah. is still here in Utah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. In I know fact, obviously they, KBYU is. But. Yeah, I think KUED they broadcast up from right right up there at the U. So, hmm. can you get me on the TV? <laughs> well, I don't work in television anymore, so probably not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what do you do now? Oh, you play music, huh? I play music and I teach guitar lessons. 
Oh wow! Yeah. So you actually pay the bills. Just I do. Yeah. My music second music and guitar. That's right. My second degree was in in uh, jazz guitar performance. Oh, word. So, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting though. Uh, one of the cool things about uh, working in television is um, I noticed this happened a lot of times. Is a lot of local bands uh, were able to get on some of the local television stations uh, because they're always looking for content, especially on the morning shows. And so that's why, especially a really good um, uh, uh, channel two is really good about this. They they always have they well at least back when I was working there they would have bands on fairly regularly in the morning. So, so about when was that? That would have been, man. I left there in two thousand seven. So um, yeah, so that would have been. I was there from two thousand two to two thousand seven. So, uh, I might have to talk to you more about this. Because, dude, I want to be on the TV. Yeah. Another good one, Park City TV used to do that a lot, too. I don't know if they still do or not, but, uh, yeah, Parks, Parks they, they've got a cool setup there. So, Word. Yeah. I was on TV once. That's how I became Judas, actually. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> I was on This American Life. <laughs> the, the, the other Judas became Judas in other ways. <laughs> uh, well, he, he s- stabbed the Son of God in the back then, man. Yeah. I mean, uh, what else do you got to do to get famous? <laughs> yeah. I just impersonated him. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yep, that's how I am, the Judas. I <laughs> impersonated the original. Wow. Right, yeah. Wow. None of that Judas Priest bullshit. <laughs> yeah, but that's a good band. Yeah, it was all right. <laughs> Halford was okay. <laughs> what was his other band? Uh, wasn't he in, like, Deep Purple for a minute or something? Oh, he might have been, man. That or band was that Dio? That- <laughs> I think that was Dio. Was it Dio, really? I think Dio was in Deep Purple. No kidding. One of those guys was. I think it was Dio. Well, I might have to look this up, and if I'm wrong, we'll Dio, just Dio, Ronnie James too. Dio sang for Black Sabbath. He was in Sabbath, too. Yeah. I knew that, and I actually recently found that out. Okay. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was him. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong. I think he was, wasn't he also in, like, Rainbow? Dio, I believe, was in Rainbow. And Maybe. he had another band called Elf. Yeah. That was like. I feel like I need to do. Uh, I feel like I need to go do a little more deep dive into my uh, my metal some, music history. Some holy diving. Yeah, some holy. Oh yeah, oh, very good. Into your metal history. <laughs> <laughs> very very uh, nice. Uh, all right, that was terrible. All right, let's get into another swan. <laughs> uh, let's let's holy dive into the next song, yes. shall we? Uh, what do you want to play next? We just did your honky tonk. You got a lot of different styles here, and so yeah. that's another reason I'm kind of stoked for this guy. Is oh, you think that we're just gonna listen to honky tonk all night? You are in store for a surprise, my friend. <laughs> In the 
desert at night. code really yeah <laughs> my mother is nothing of the sort well, here's what I think of that that's it I'm offended yeah, well, <laughs> I didn't appreciate your first remark my friend we could do this all night Oh, yeah? <laughs> now you're starting to take out my equipment. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to have to end this. Oh! Bitch slap. Oh. <laughs> no musicians were actually harmed in the recording of this production. At least not this one. They're right, right, yeah. <laughs> A few more might be later on in the show. <laughs> Because you know how expendable musicians are, you know. Oh, that's they're true. disposable. Yep. That's uh, it. We usually sacrifice a few towards the end of the show to the almighty uh, gods of Guar. Well, you know, the good thing about it is <laughs> that uh, once one musician is out, there's about ten others sitting in the wings waiting to take their place. For real, right? Yeah. You can just go out and, like, you know, go to any big city and, and find a guy uh, panhandling on the side of the road. And just like, hey, you want to be in a band? And they'll probably say no because they make more money than you. <laughs> yeah, probably, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, I've had a couple of friends that that is how they pay their bills. Yeah. And they didn't have to go to college to learn jazz guitar. Yeah, that's they true. Just, you know, there's a, a, a guy who, I don't know what happened to him, but I was seeing him around quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, what was it, like two years ago? Yeah. And he played nothing but the buckets, just a bunch of five-gallon buckets. Wow. And he had a... Uh, Maybe a few little metal things. He had this big metal dish that would just lay on the ground, and he would mm -hmm. smack it whenever, yeah. or just pick it up and drop it when you needed a big long, uh, yeah, kind of thing. And he would just play along with a boombox too. So yeah, uh, it would be songs people knew because that. I hate to say it, but that's kind of how you get the crowd. That's how you'd have to do something like that, know. for sure. Yeah. You know, especially if you're just playing for anyone, everyone. Yeah, that's right. And he would just keep a beat along with those buckets. That's cool. And elaborate the beat. Mm hmm And, yeah, just as long as he's playing songs people like, he, he wouldn't even have a tip jar. He'd have a sign as to how you Venmo him. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's right? perfect. That's yeah. how you do it nowadays. Yeah. And it works. Yeah. Much better than, you know, and uh, like... I can't recommend this to just any homeless guy panhandling because you need a bank account for them to Venmo you. Yeah. <laughs> obviously. That's right. But if you have that ability, mm -hmm. uh, apparently, yeah, he was getting, he said that on, on an average, he would at least make two or $300. That's incredible. You know, and kind of depending on where you were doing it. Yeah. If you're going outside of like a jazz game or something. Mm -hmm. But just wherever, uh, there's going to be a lot of people. Yeah. And, yeah, obviously the whole like hashtag thing, Venmo thing. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> and you still got a little uh, uh, upturned bucket. Yeah, <laughs> for that's actual right. real cash <laughs> so donations. Drop and it in. <laughs> but he said he made way more money from the Venmo because people can do it from their cars and stuff. Yeah, and, and most people don't carry change or cash with them anymore. Yeah, right. And if yeah. they do, well, they give it to that guy. Yeah, you know, I was in uh, I was in San Antonio a couple of months ago. And my wife and I are walking down, walking around, and this uh, this homeless guy hits us up for cash. We're like, "Oh, we're sorry, we don't carry any cash on us." And he, oh, well, I've got Venmo. <laughs> no kidding. That is the future, guys. Even yeah. homeless people are like, "Oh, you can Venmo me." <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it was wild, man. We also got chased by a giant cockroach there. Did he have Venmo? He probably did. He's like, what do you need? What do you need? Leave me alone. Uh, I just need about three fifty. Yeah. Do you have Venmo? Uh, actually, yes, I do. Yeah, Austin, <laughs> Texas, man. That's a wild town. Yeah, even the fucking cockroaches there have Venmo, folks. Well, it's in Texas, so everything in Texas is bigger, so you could throw a saddle on them, too. 
You could ride the cockroach. You could ride the cockroach. There is your next song, right? There. <laughs> ride the cockroach. Speaking of Dio, <laughs> ride the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, We're coming up with some serious gold tonight. Uh, this is good stuff. <laughs> Saddle the cockroach. That was uh, awesome. Gross. <laughs> Well, have you ever seen one of those things? Have you ever ate one? Oh, well, no. <laughs> Why would I eat one? <laughs> They're edible. Well, if, I'm sure just about anything is edible. And especially the big ones. You can cook them up. Yeah? The Madagascar ones? Yeah. Well, uh, like the you're in ones? Texas, so I'm assuming they're Texan. They're Texan They're Texan cockroaches. cockroaches. Yeah. Uh, and if they're Texan, I assume they better be bigger. Oh, oh of course. Well, everything's bigger in Texas. Than Madagascan. Right. Yeah. Okay, now I got to look them up on the map if which is bigger, <laughs> Madagascar or Texas. <laughs> Probably still Texas, I'm going to bet. Yeah. But even though Texas has got some, you know, some critters you don't want to mess with. Oh yeah. I would bet Madagascar has got some meaner critters. Man, that's off the coast of Africa. Yeah, they everything wants to kill you of there. Venomous reptiles. Yeah. I think that they even have parts of the jungle that humankind has never even hit yet. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I bet, yeah. And they got tons of chameleons. Yeah. And I heard they caught a seolacanth. Uh, so what? A prehistoric fish. Really? Off the coast. Wow. Of Madagascar. Yeah. That's crazy. Again, that's something I'm going to have to look up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for spreading false allegations. That's right. That's right. We don't want have to. Neil uh... Young threaten to like... <laughs> You know, take his music off of whatever platform I'm on. That's right. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I'm spreading false misinformation, information. right? Yeah. I apologize, Neil Young, if uh, there was no Cialacanth <laughs> caught off the coast of Madagascar. <laughs> Just want to keep my ass clean. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure there was. It's a prehistoric fish. That's almost the equivalent of catching a dinosaur. Has Jeremy Wade ever tried to catch him? Jeremy who? Jeremy Wade, man. The, you know, like River Monsters guy. If he hasn't, then there's one thing on his bucket list. I don't know. I'm going to have to look it up. If he, Yeah. Uh, maybe he was the guy who actually caught it. <laughs> he could have been, been the guy, right? Yeah, if anybody. I mean, he had his own TV show, right? Couldn't have been Steve Irwin. He would have got stabbed or something. Yeah. Something would have happened. Got yeah. electrocuted. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what happens. <laughs> the stingray uh, beat him to the punch. <laughs> Well, I guess that's probably the, the, the signal for another song. <laughs> Is uh, where you'd normally put a cricket chirping. <laughs> or a cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> a cockroach hissing. Okay. All right, then. We need to make that the new thing. No more crickets in an awkward moment. We put cockroach hissing. Cockroach. Anytime there's an awkward moment. Or cicadas or something. Why not? Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, let another bug have a moment in the spotlight, huh? <laughs> exactly. What an earwig or something. <laughs> what the hell earwigs make noises? You know, there are a lot of bugs out there. You could really do a whole show on that. Right. Every time you just make an awkward moment, give another bug noise. <laughs> that's right. Like a... I was going to say a butterfly, but those yeah, things just sound pretty... like a little rabbit fart. Well, they, they flutter. Wow. Ah. Yeah. Like a rabbit fart. Yeah. I, I've never rabbit farts rabbit flutter? Fart. I, I, I don't know. I've never gotten that close to her. I don't like rabbits. <laughs> Me neither. They're always farting like butterflies and messing up the atmosphere. All right. We have Michael Payne here on KW Judas. Thank you all for bearing with us tonight. <laughs> it's been an interesting evening. Free Radio
They said there was no early departure That's why I ride the late train all night long I see the faces of my memories I hear the laughter, I feel the tears Now there's so much a part of me Sun shines upon history Etched in stone As new memories are born I pass through the realm of the unknown And somehow I feel I'm home When I see faces of you And faces of me I see the good times and the bad Now they're all a part of me They made me who I am Faces of is of me I see the joy and the pain Now I wonder if all of these tears I have cried in vain I remember their lives 
laughter and pain I can still see history stain Leaving its mark upon the pages Leaving its mark upon the faces I'm grateful for the lessons I'm grateful for the changes I'm grateful for the souls, the souls behind the faces, faces of you and faces of me. I see the good times and the bad. Now they're all a part of me. They made me who I am. Faces of you and faces of me. I see. Joy and the pain. Now I wonder if all of these tears I have cried in vain. Enough of the goofing around. <laughs> <laughs> I think that after listening to a couple songs from this guy, it can be concluded that he's not just your average singer-songwriter with an acoustic guitar. So, kind of leads me to a few questions. What all are you doing on these recordings? Are you playing every instrument? No, just uh, guitar and vocals. Okay, cool. Yeah. So do you pay studio musicians, or do you actually have, like, a performing band? I actually uh, play, uh, I actually hire studio musicians, and then, um, and then I hire uh, whoever's available uh, from my pool of musicians for when it's time to go do shows and things like that. Right, right. Yeah. That can be easier and harder. Correct. In certain ways, because, yeah, it's like if one guy can't make it, usually you'll have, like, another guy. Yeah. Or, or girl, or they, or them, whoever wants to fill in yeah. on whatever instrument it is. Right. But at the same time, it means that you are going to have to be making a little more money to be able to pay them, correct? Yeah, that's right. Because right. usually, yeah, if you want somebody on call like that, mm -hmm. you got to be able to make it worth their while. <laughs> yeah. Well, I kind of purposely make sure that I book gigs that pay me enough to be able to pay the good players. Word. Yeah. Do you need an acoustic black metal banjoist? <laughs> well, you never know. Who can't read music? Oh, well, you never know. I mean, sometimes those are the best ones. I mean, when I was, <laughs> I mean, when I was back in Nashville, a lot of those guys they they could read the Nashville number chart system, but but if you put like legitimate sheet music in front of them, I mean, you, they they can read it, some of them. I mean, some of them could. I did a I did a jazz session back there, and all of those guys could read. Um, and um, and then I did a, a couple of country sessions back there as well, and it was all Nashville number chart stuff. Um, I did have one guy uh, say he was uh, he he was curious to see the actual uh, arrangement, the actual chart arrangement that I'd written out um, that wasn't the Nashville number system, but actually the uh, the music notation. So I was like, oh, fortunately, I had that stuff on hand. So 
So I'm not gonna lie, I am not familiar with this Nashville number system you speak of. Ah, uh, okay. Is that anything like tablature? <laughs> no, no, not really. Um, what it is is it's uh, basically what um, the musicians will do, uh, and this this goes for any act that you might play for as a, as a sideman. Like um, I've played for a couple of different uh, Nashville touring acts, and each time they would uh, basically email me a bunch of PDFs of handwritten. Um, basically charts that's like a chord progression but it's right. done in a number system and the number system correlates to uh, what number that particular chord would be in the scale degree of the key that the song is written in and so huh. that's the Nashville number system so ra- rather than wa- than write you know um, rather than write something like like G E minor you know um, and then you know A minor D and then back to G something like that it would be uh, like like a one and then a uh, two like minor you know and then which would be like right. a two minus or like a one and then a six minus and then a two minus and then a five and they'd actually be um, you know Arabic numerals not Roman numerals like they would do in classical music it would actually be um, um, the numbers that we use for everyday writing numbers today so that's cool yeah, yeah. and You're it's just something new huh? yeah and usually what they'll do is at the top of the chart uh, they'll write in a box what the key of the song is in so if the key was G um, they would write G and then they'd do those numbers you know and so if like so it was like a one six two five one like I just described then the numbers would be one six two five one so yeah I think yeah. I get it yeah for being one who is not that musically educated <clears throat> right uh, so you just have to know your you have to kind of know your theory kind of like you know like the back of your hand kind of in order to be able to, to do that kind of stuff so right yeah but i still think i get how it works yeah no no well and, and actually yeah i mean i think that uh a majority of musicians and i think the reason they do that number one is it's a lot quicker than reading notation and yeah. um and and people that if they're not great sight readers of notation they can at least like you say get how it works you know and so they you know so i mean if you're a bass player sitting in on a gig that you've never played with that band before you know you can you can just follow the charts and be just fine so right yeah that's my biggest thing is uh <laughs> learning any of that stuff yeah i've thought about joining bands like that but i play pretty much entirely by ear yeah there's yeah. a lot of that too i mean obviously there's there's a lot of that you know and there's a lot of um you know kind of you know listening to what the other people are giving you and kind of responding off that i mean there's there's a lot of those types of situations that are very spontaneous that way so and if you're good enough you can still make that work for sure but if say I don't know. You're supposed to just fill in, mm-hmm. and the show is like tonight. Yeah, uh, you got to be real good if you're just gonna fill in playing by ear. Right, you got to uh, be real good, and that's and that's what the notation or and anything that's, to follow. Yeah, that's what the number chart for is for, and that's that's right. kind of what it's designed for anyway. But but obviously, it, it takes learning that skill of knowing what the number chart system is. So which I don't. Yeah, <laughs> you know, a lot. Of, interestingly enough, I um, also played with a lot of um, uh, guys based out of L.A. And um, they kind of do a similar thing, but they don't really write it down. They just talk about it. Oh, okay, this song's a one six two five one, and all that kind of stuff. And you know, just follow me for the changes for like when you change, you know. And I had had this one gig where um, it was a song I'd never played before that the singer decided he wanted to throw into the set. And so the whole time I was watching the uh, the the keyboard player, the piano player, who was the music director of the band, and he was just sitting there flashing up numbers with his hands, you know, like one. You know, six. You know, in between playing, you know, chords. You know, two, <laughs> five. One. And I was just kind of following him with my guitar, and like it was like when it was time to take take a solo, he was like, "Okay, take a solo." And at, at that particular song we were playing, I think in the key of E, you know, and so um, and so I was like, "Okay, well, there you go. There's there's your solo." So, but yeah. Sounds like it works okay, though. It I mean, does. If everyone speaks the, the same language, yeah. or roughly. <laughs> For sure, yeah, yeah. I've seen some bands that's, that, uh, I don't know, they seem to, and when I say language, you know what I mean. Yeah. I'm not talking like Spanish, German, English. Right. I mean, there's just like musical languages. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with John Zorn. Uh, I've um, heard, I think I've heard the name. They've kind of created some almost games you can kind of play with music that involve cards and hand gestures and oh, all interesting. sorts of stuff. And I've seen local bands around here try and mimic that same idea. I think they call it Cobra, but there's probably lots of different ways to do hmm. it. John Zorn has figured out how to, like, he has a series of albums that are like, this is how you play hockey with right. music. Huh. This is how you play, uh, like, Pong 
with music. That's cool. And it's hard to listen to. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, I had, I just ordered one of the albums without listening to it, just because <laughs> it's John Zorn, and you always, you never know what you're going to get. Never know what you're going to get, yeah. With, with that guy. Yeah. And that's, um, you listen to it once. Yeah. You're like, I get the, the concept. For sure. It was a cool idea. It, I'm sure it's a lot of fun for you guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It. You know, the, I think that's the great thing about about anything musical, right? I mean, is it's like good is purely subjective, isn't it? You know, it's uh, it's like whatever kind of strikes a chord with you know, pun intended for you know the person <laughs> listening to it, right? <laughs> also entertaining for the sometimes can be to watch, but not as fun to listen. Right. When it comes to a lot of those sort of groups, you know. Yeah. Uh, if you just record it and go home and listen to it, you're going to be like, what the hell were they doing? Yeah. Uh, but if you were there and you're watching them make these weird noises and everything, uh, you can't even describe what it was like. Yeah, that's right. You know, and I've seen a lot of groups along those lines as well. Um, can we still call that jazz? I don't know. It's kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, jazz kind of does whatever it wants. Right. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the purpose of jazz, right? You know, it's all about that that discovery and experimentation. Right. Some so. people just take it too far. <laughs> true. True. Yeah. There's, um, you know, when when I was in music school, they would always have us listen to a lot of different music and go see a lot of different artists perform and stuff in the in the various different subgenres of jazz and within all those different subgenres, and. Uh, you know, some of the stuff I really dug and got into, and the other stuff I was just like, I don't really need to listen to that ever again. <laughs> I mean, jazz covers so much ground that I almost it think it would be, okay, it'd be very difficult to say I love all forms of jazz. Right. Because, sure, I love lots of forms of jazz and yeah. everything, but... There are definitely some, almost on like both ends of the spectrum, where it just gets too out of control, where I'm just like, okay, enough. Yeah. I can listen to this for maybe a minute or two, you know, yeah. where the saxophones are just... <laughs> 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 yep. It's just drums are just... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's another one. John Zorn has done an album like that. It's just fucking chaos. Yeah. And it's fun to listen to when you're in that kind of mood. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. But then, like, other other stuff where the jazz is, like, too much the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, it's too listener-friendly and right. too organized. And um, I'm not even talking about grocery store jazz. Yeah. Even grocery store jazz can <laughs> kind of be sort of nice sometimes. Yeah, you know? absolutely, Especially absolutely. Now that well, you and never some of that, it anymore. yeah, I mean, you know, and some of that was the the pop music of our of our grandparents' generation, right? You yeah. know, and and so and so, yeah, of course, it's going to be a little bit more commercially acceptable and commercially digestible, right? Yeah, um, but the, you know, and, um, but then there's also stuff that uh, that I think that that branched out from that even that, that was still interesting and, um, you know, kind of came, brought in some other styles, you know, like a group that I'm thinking of right now is, um, Grant Green. Um, so, uh, uh, that one. Grant Green was this incredible guitar player and I bring him up cause he's a guitar player like, like I am. And, yeah. and, um, you know, we used, I used to, to transcribe a lot of his solos in, in music school. And interestingly enough, he kind of like, he was one of these, these players who kind of changed with the times, you know, where his, maybe his approach to playing didn't really change, but the kind of music that he was, he was responding to and playing to changed. And so, you know, when he first started out, there was, you know, bands like the Dave Brubeck Quartet and things like that, that were really popular. And so this kind of like mid-century cool jazz type, you know, West Coast jazz type vibe. And so he was doing that for a while. And then as it got kind of into the seventies and, and kind of like funk started to come in, you know, like the kind of like the kind of more R&B funky type stuff right. he started to embrace that too you know but as a as an instrumental jazz musician and it was really kind of cool and so you know it's kind of neat to see um, that happen you know because then it kind of make maybe brings jazz into you know at least at that time you know what was happening musically at the time which is kind of cool is he still around so, Grant Green no he's 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 long gone now uh, but yeah so like about what was the era Grant Green um the mostly like uh, early '60s through mid '70s was kind of like his heyday. Word. So yeah, great player. Oh yeah. Any other recommendations? Because I mean, I'm 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 all ears for more, you know, like good jazz artists 
that I should go look up. Oh, for sure, yeah. Or, or any any style. Well, really. I, I did mention the Dave Brubeck Quartet. They're one of my favorites. Um, I've, I've heard a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Take Five actually um, the, was was the number one selling single uh, jazz single the year it came out. Um, I believe that same year. Um, or the year before was the the year that the Kind of Blue, Miles Davis Kind of Blue album came out, which is, yeah. you know, uh, everybody says that, hey, if you're going to start listening to jazz, start with Kind of Blue, you know. Um, uh, I could see that. Yeah, and mostly because it was <laughs> it was the top-selling jazz album um, uh, at, that, uh, at that time, I guess. I don't know if of all time, but certainly at that time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I would, I'd recommend Dave Brubeck. I'd recommend, um, Grant Green, like I mentioned. Um, and then even getting into like some of the other stuff in the, in the seventies, um, you know, but this, again, this is purely subject to taste, right. And, and flavor. Like I really dug some of the stuff that Robin Ford was doing in the late seventies, you know, with, uh, what the band that would become the yellow jackets. Um, Word. but again, again, that was, you know, again, the personal preference, you know, some people listen to, <laughs> like I, I played with the drummer, like, and, and we, we played in, we played in various different types of bands together and uh and anytime we'd play like jazz you know jazz fusion or whatever you know we'd play like you know um you know just all different kinds of things and um and and i was like anytime i'd bring up the possibility of doing a yellow jackets too and he'd shoot it down because he hated the yellow jackets <laughs> <you know? laughs> so so i mean it's like purely subjective you know so uh, but those are those are guys i like so right well yeah. that's that's what it's about is you know your influences and right uh, yeah, like uh, what? John Pizzarelli, great, great player. He's more traditional jazz, so but Word. he's great. Yeah, I know the name. Yeah, again, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like a lot of these names, I'm a, I'm more familiar with than others. Sure, you know, everybody knows Miles Davis mostly because the Adam Sandler movie. Right. <laughs> I hate to say it, but dude, I mean, in a way, he did Miles Davis a favor. That old lady. Continue myself, Miles Davis. <laughs> yeah, yep. If peeing your pants is cool. <laughs> well, interestingly enough, I mean, Miles Davis, uh, he his career spanned pretty much every single different genre and subgenre of jazz. I mean, oh, he, yeah. he, he tried to do it all. The more you get into that guy, like yeah. the, the first dude you were talking about, I was like, kind of like Miles Davis. Um, Grant Green, uh, I mean, kind of, uh, as far as like a guitar player goes, but it's funny when you listen to Grant Green play, he's, he play, he's playing more blues licks than anything. I see. Yeah. Um, but, but he was kind of lumped into that category, you know, but he's very, he's a very pentatonic-y kind of bluesy kind of player. So word, yeah. but as far as just being able to adapt to the, uh, changing of the genres throughout time. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah, yeah. So he certainly did that, and, and definitely, right. maybe not to the extent Miles Davis did, but yeah, that's more what I was referring to. Gotcha. Because I mean, he had like more than one, com- almost complete like changes of style. Yeah. You know, hundred percent. At yeah. least three, kind of like. Well, if you listen to this Miles Davis, you're not. It's not going to sound like this Miles Davis. Yeah. And I'm not sure exactly where, you know, what years kind of were the changing points and everything. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I actually was just given a whole bunch of CDs from a friend of mine once everybody was starting to go digital. I still collect CDs. That's awesome. I will as long as I possibly can. Uh, yep. And if people are giving away their old CDs. You'll take them. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Especially if it's like a fellow music geek yeah. who I know I can trust your musical opinion. I mean, he just had this big old box full of stuff, some of which I recognize the names, some of which I wouldn't be a fan of had I not ganked that CD. Yeah. You know, I didn't know who Al Green was until I ganked an Al Green CD. And even just judging by the cover... Just this white background that's all like floofy looking. Yeah. I, I doesn't look like a CD I would like. Right. But I still grabbed it anyway, and it was like one of my favorites. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I loved. I love Al Green. Yeah. And uh, you know, of course, went and got more of his stuff. It, it all started with me saying, "Man, I need to get me some John Coltrane." And he was like, "Oh, you want some John Coltrane?" He pulls out a whole box. He's, he's like, "Here's all my old CDs." Oh yeah. I since I've uploaded them to my computer and I just well now people don't even do that anymore they just mm-hmm. get it off Spotify or whatever right but yeah he let me take whatever he wanted that's awesome and a lot of stuff are like I don't know if you're familiar with Critters Buggin or like Skerrick or there's some weird jazz huh um 
you know, Skerek is a saxophone player, but he gets weird. He runs his sax through all sorts of different effects pedals. Oh, that's cool. And stuff, and he's played with all sorts of other mm -hmm. uh, eclectic musicians. He's yeah. done stuff with uh, Les Claypool. Wow. From Primate. Like, um, I don't know if you know Les Claypool. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, he had a band called the Fearless Flying Frog Brigade <laughs> that was a lot more jazzy, a lot more proggy, a lot more psychedelic. Right. Um, it's my second favorite thing that Les Claypool's been involved with besides Primus. Oh, wow. He's got a lot of other stuff outside uh -huh. of Primus, and it's all pretty good. Yeah. The new stuff with uh, the Claypool Lennon Delirium. Hmm. He teamed up with, oh, was it John Lennon's son? Is it Julian? I think so. Uh-huh. And they made two albums together. Wow. That is the best thing he's done in a while. Let's check that outside out. Outside Primus. Yeah. Um. Aside from, yeah, Fearless Flying Frog Brigade is, like, the one side project I wish he would do more with. Mm -hmm. And they did, like, an album or three albums, I think. Yeah. And just haven't really done much since. But, yeah, that had Skerrick, the saxophone player, and, you know, a bunch of other people that yeah. were involved with all sorts of other scenes and, and whatnot. It was, like, almost kind of a super band. Wow. Sort of just based yeah. on who was in it. That's cool. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's another thing that we could talk about all night <laughs> yeah for sure is different jazz jazz influences oh yeah and all the other weirdos that <laughs> you and i both are into <laughs> but as elder wheeler once said less talk more rock <laughs> there you go <laughs> and thus it shall be we have michael payne thank you for joining us tonight hey thanks for having me kw judas free radio pro Last night, I drove by your window Hoping to see that the light was on For peace of mind, I just needed to know That tonight you wouldn't be in his arms The sun is hot in my memory and the wind blew softly when you first looked at me The voice of an angel began to speak And although I was amazed, I began to think Maybe I was wrong Maybe I was wrong Are you gonna believe? There's a joker in the corner Something up his sleeve And the fool on stage plays a waiting game If he waits forever Will it be in vain? Love pours like water from a stream Tempted but you would never take a drink Thirsty but holding out for the wine Mr. Vintage never could mirror this heart of mine Maybe I was wrong
go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. One small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. For a moment the world came together. In the summer of 69. Working hand in hand, setting all differences aside To make that one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind Daddy was in the academy, training to be a police man His brother was in the navy, fighting in Vietnam Protests and riots in the streets seemed that no one could get along It took a group of dreamers to meet Land on the moon and prove them all wrong They took that one small step for man One giant leap for mankind For a moment the world came together In the summer of 69 Differences aside To make that one small step For man One giant leap For mankind Laying in the back Of my daddy's truck Staring up at the stars Dreaming of flying A shuttle to space Maybe even visit Mars There were savings and loans an iron curtain and the Cold War going on While a group of dreamers gave us hope Built a space station to prove us all wrong Just like that one small step for man One giant leap for mankind For a moment the world came together In the summer of 69 Working hand in hand Setting all differences aside To make that one small step for man One giant leap for mankind They showed us that working alongside your brother Taught us to love one another In a world where no one can seem to agree Maybe space exploration is the way to be Hey, kid, have you had an audio colonoscopy lately? Ooh, ah, ah. ah did they let you take the microphone home with you afterwards? Oh, oh. Well, now you can with Derpensley's old haggard Ziploc bag. Oh, oh. Hmm, you're not a real person, are you? <laughs> okay, heard enough. David Dragman. Uh, uh. You have committed many musical transgressions for which you must atone for. <laughs> I sentence thee to an eternity of thirty lashes <laughs> from your own mother. Say, wait a minute. Don't do it 
How can you have an eternity of 30 lashes when eternity lasts forever and 30, well, literally ends at 30? What do you mean? Well, if you go any further, it's no longer 30. You do have a point there. Besides, what did he actually do anyways? He refused to buy an old Ziploc bag from Dennis. Oh, yes. Sorry there, Dave. You should have bought Durban Street. And remember, if it doesn't say Durban, it is not Durban Street. <laughs> well, that was a word from our sponsor, Derpenschle. Uh They're the ones that grease our palms and put the peanut shells in your pockets at the end of the show. So, yeah, make sure to remind me about that, and we'll make sure you get paid. All right. Because, yeah, Derpenschle, I mean, they, even though you never know what in the hell they're going to do next, uh, they have <laughs> definitely have facilitated a lot of nonsensory over the years and put up with all this, you know, K.W. Judas nincompoopery. <laughs> Nonsensory nincompoopery <laughs> incorporated. That's Derpenschle. It's the Derpenschle way. All right. So before we end the show, um, where's the best place to find your music? Well, you probably, you probably, <laughs> you probably, you probably have to go to uh, to Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, uh, YouTube. Uh, it's all there, all on those uh, different places. You can listen to it. I will say uh, the older, kind of more countryish stuff is under Mike Payne, and the newer okay. stuff, um, the newer stuff uh, is uh, under Michael Payne. So, so, how many how many albums do you got out? Uh, let's see. Only one full album and uh, one full album uh, and one single under Mike Payne, and then uh, four singles under Michael Payne. Word. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. And so you have to look them up separately. Yeah, you'd Mike have to. Payne, yeah, Mike Michael Payne or Payne Michael Payne. Yeah. Although, if you go to um, if you go to Michael Payne on Spotify, um, I do have a playlist that's um, basically uh, this is Michael Payne, and it's got some of the older stuff, the Mike Payne stuff in there as well. Cool. So, You'll have yeah. to send me a link. Okay. And I will put that in the description below. Sounds good. So if anybody wants to get down on some more pain. Oh, yeah. The House of Pain. <laughs> you will feel the pain. You will feel the pain with an E. And it's uh, <laughs> it's it's a good thing that we waited till the end of the show to get into those puns. Yes. I mean, like, I, I was really holding off. <laughs> But I knew I was going to come sometime around. Well, of course. I mean, you know. <laughs> it'd be, you know, I invite abuse. It'd be impolite not to accept. I, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've heard a million and a half. Oh, no, no, never. Stupid little yeah, plays no, in that no, one. No, no, you know? <laughs> I'm sure that's never a pain in your ass. <laughs> no, no. That was actually the one that was the most popular one on the school year, in the schoolyard. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, you know we're here. <laughs> yeah, pain in the, in the patootie. I, yeah. <laughs> a real pain in the patella. I like that that one patella yeah, patella yeah that was yeah. off of the old hercules oh okay and i still use that all, oh, okay. all the time nice so you can be a pain in my patella well all right well thank you all right let's get to the <laughs> next song and is there anything you'd like to tell the kitties before we go I would just say that this last song, uh, Bougainvillea, is about my hometown, Palm Desert, California, as well as the song we heard earlier in the show uh, called Desert at Night. Word. Yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. Michael Payne, KW Judas, Free Radio Provo. Thank you all for listening. I've been away from you for far too long So I'm making my way home Down through the pass of San Gregorio To my Mecca in the sun The fronds rustle in the breeze Desert valley of cactus and palm trees Above the sand purple mountains rise There's a sweet smell of bougainvillea If you go 
down just north of El Paseo There's a barber named Joe Next door to Kiddy's Fountain and Grill Where you can talk to the locals It's a hundred degrees in the shade Bright blue sky each and every day A warm smile on nearly every face In a land graced with bougainvillea There's an oasis in my backyard With yuccas, palms, agave and palo verde Next to the pool in a terracotta A little pink flower called Bougainvillea We'd like to thank you for joining us on yet another exciting and exclusive episode of KW Tier to Sun Free Radio Provo. We now turn you back to our regular free radio program.